Hey everybody, time to shift gears significantly. I know this is not typically what you tune into this channel for, but uh, we got to talk a little bit of Seattle Mariners. And you know what? Maybe it's appropriate that we do this right now. Maybe it's appropriate with the Mar with the Seahawks season basically being over. Maybe it's appropriate that I turn some of my attention towards another Seattle sports team because it's what the Seahawks deserve. They deserve to have me pay attention to another sports team in Seattle because they're bad and this team actually has a chance to be good, or at the very least, interesting. So, Seattle Mariners. We got to talk about them. World Series wrapped up a little bit ago. Free agency. We're about to have to make some interesting decisions. And, look, we were two games shy of the playoffs last year. The holes in this roster are obvious and glaring and probably cost us a lot of wins the areas where this team needs to improve are clear so we've got some young guys who might be on the come up at some point in the next baseball season uh julio rodriguez i don't really know if he's that close to being called up to the big leagues but he's on track hopefully you get a better season from kyle lewis a full season from a kyle lewis um, uh, Kelnick really came on strong late. You've got a couple other guys that might be able to make the leap. Logan, Logan Gilbert's a big one. If he can step his game up next year, that, then that's huge. <clears throat> but it's not enough. This team needs more. And whether or not they get more will be determined by what they do in this upcoming free agency period. There seems to me to be two significant needs for the Seattle Mariners looking at this upcoming 2022 season. Two needs that they need to fill if they want to feel really good about their odds of making the playoffs and maybe even making a run. It's scary to go out and start spending money, but this team has money to spend, and I think now is the time. This team has groomed enough young talent. This team has enough players starting to play well at the same time, now's the time to spring into action and spend some money. So I'm going to take this video to run down some guys that the Mariners might consider picking up, and I'll talk about what I would like to do a little bit, if possible. Keeping in mind that baseball's salary cap is a little uh, finicky, you can um, definitely mess around with it more than some other salary caps, but regardless... I know this team doesn't have infinite money, so we have to be we have to be smart here. Okay, so looking at this team, looking at this Mariners team, it seems to me that we're trying to bolster our infield. We're losing Kyle Seeger. I don't think he's coming back, so we need a new third baseman, and I don't know if we really have anybody cooking who's ready to take that role. Um, Kyle Seeger played so many of our games last year, missed so few starts, that it seems to me we don't have a whole lot of confidence in anybody taking that job right now that's actually in the show. So we probably need some help there. And Toro, I don't know if we view him as a full-time second baseman. He might be more of a fill-in guy. He might be more of a utility guy. I don't know if we even view him as a long as a more permanent starter. Obviously, he set the world on fire after the trade, but then he drastically cooled down. I don't know who the real Abraham Toro is, but I know he's not the second coming of Babe Ruth the way he looked when he first got here. So, we need some help in the infield. We're going to take a look at some guys that the Mariners are considering and we'll we'll, we'll see what we're looking at here. Uh, the first guy we're going to look at here is probably the most interesting. It's a Seiya Suzuki, another Japanese import. He's only 27 right now, which is pretty young, younger than anybody else we're going to be looking at, I think. And he reportedly plays third baseman, shortstop, and right field. He's got a great swing. I saw some uh, highlights. I watched a little bit of tape. Uh, he's got a very smooth swing. He's got great plate discipline, but he also hits for power. If you take a look at what he's done in his career over in Japan for Hiroshima... Um, this last season, he had a 38 home runs, batting average of 319. Over his career, he's got a batting average of 309. 
Uh, he steals bases. He stole uh, 25 bases a couple years ago for Hiroshima, so he does have some speed. Um, he walks more than he strikes out in recent times, I believe. He had 103 walks in 2019 compared to 81 strikeouts. Had more walks than strikeouts for in 2021. Um, this, this dude's pretty remarkable at the plate. <clears throat> and his versatility is also promising. This would probably be the most fun thing that you could do to get the next big Japanese import over on the Mariners. Now, would he choose the Mariners over another team like the Yankees or the Red Sox? I don't know. But this should certainly be a top priority. This guy clearly looks like somebody who's going to project well to the major leagues. So... I would definitely love to make Seiya Suzuki the centerpiece of our off-season acquisitions. And he would definitely address a hole in this roster. Okay, we got to start having a little bit less fun now because we're going to take a look at some guys we know from the major leagues, the American major leagues. But they're still interesting players. Uh, first is Javier Baez, longtime Chicago Cub. Last year he was a uh, Met for a little bit. About to turn 29, so not terribly old yet. Age is not a big concern. He's got good versatility in the um, infield. He can play shortstop, second baseman, and third baseman. Um, only one of those positions is solidly filled for the Mariners right now with J.P. Crawford playing short. So that versatility is nice. Um, he, Baez has won a gold glove in his career, and... He played fairly well for the Mets after the trade. He hit almost 300. Um, he, he didn't hit for a ton of power, but he didn't play in a ton of games as well. So so it was still a pretty respectable season for Baez. <clears throat> in fact, I think you can pretty reasonably say he was much better after the trade. So I'm not worried about him running out of gas. Now, this is definitely a guy who swings for the fences and strikes out a lot. Uh, he had 184 strikeouts last season, but he doesn't hit for a super low average. He's not one of those players like you find on the Yankees who just everything's either a home run or a strikeout, and they have a batting average of like 190. So Javier Baez is still capable defensively, still a good defensive player, and hits for good power, still has good power, and manages to hit for power without sacrificing all of his uh, batting average. So... If you want to bring him in, that would make a decent amount of sense to me. Uh, we also have Marcus Simeon uh, from Toronto. He's a free agent. He's just turned 31, which is... I don't think you're in the danger zone yet, but you're definitely getting there. Now, Marcus Simeon's a little bit of a difficult one because until before 2019, there wasn't anything that remarkable about him, right? Right. He never broke 100 ops plus. He hit for power once or twice. He had decent power, decent pop, decent averages, but he was nothing special. And then in 2019, he almost won MVP. Hit 33 home runs, batting average 289, 285, balled out. 2020, he went back to being just a below average batter. Meh, whatever. And then last year for Toronto, he almost won MVP again. So... Not a tremendous track record of reliable success. At worst, you are getting a guy who is below league average, who has a little bit of power and not too much else. But if you get the MVP candidate, now you're talking. So Marcus Simeon, I don't know if this is the right risk to take, but if he... If you write off 2020 as a fluke and he's really just coming into his own, obviously he only played 53 games in 2020, by the way, maybe maybe this is the risk to take. All right, the next guy I want to look at here is Trevor Story. This is a Colorado Rocky. I believe he's a lifelong Colorado Rocky. Um, he is about to turn, uh, well, he just turned, excuse me, 29, not too old. And this is a guy who may be in decline. And he, he also, I don't think he has a ton of experience outside of shortstop. But if you can play him at second base, I think this could be really good. So Trevor's story throughout his career, other than uh, 2017 when he had an off year, has hit for a decent average, around the 290 range. And he's hit for good power. 
Now, he does play in Colorado. We know that skews numbers, but he still had good power numbers. And the way he hits the ball seems to fit pretty well with... Uh, um, God, what, what is it called now? I keep wanting to call it Safeco. T-Mobile Park. So he would be a good fit to play in Seattle. And the main concern you would have is that 2021 was not his best year. His Ops Plus was 103. He had decent power, but not great power. He had decent average, batting average, but not great batting average. But... Um, I was reading a little bit about Trevor Story, and it seems to be that some people believe that if he embraces his destiny as a pure pull hitter, it could be really good for him. And if he came to T-Mobile Park, that would be something that could work. So Trevor Story is also a really good defensive player, I think. So if you bring him in and you have Crawford and Story at your middle infield spots, I think that's really good. And the last guy we're going to take a look at here real quick is Chris Bryant, former Cub, current uh, member of the Giants. He's about to turn 30, so approaching the danger zone, but he's not there yet. I think you guys know Chris Bryant, four-time All-Star, good power, good average. Um, not the greatest track record in recent years, but he did make the All-Star game last year. He ended up hitting about 265, ended up with 25 home runs. Uh, as far as I know, he's also good in the field. And I don't really have too strong of feelings about this one. I could go either way here. I would prefer Story. I think I would prefer Suzuki, obviously. I think I would prefer Baez. But this is a perfectly viable option. He's still played at a fairly high level at least two of the last three years. 2020, obviously he played 34 games. It was a weird year. I'm not going to read anything into that. But... Chris Bryant certainly has to be on the list, especially with Carlos Correa apparently going to the Yankees. So you got to pick from the people who are left, and that includes Chris Bryant. Okay, so if you can fill that hole, your infield is going to be looking pretty good because you still have Ty France, you still have J.P. Crawford, and hopefully one of your young catchers becomes a long-term solution there. If Torrens learns how to catch, then it can be him. If it's... Uh, Riley, then it's great, then great, it can be him, but whatever. Infield looks good. Outfield should be pretty loaded, as long as the right guys stay healthy and continue to play well. We need help with starting pitching now. That's where we need the most help, and there are a few options in free agency for a starting pitcher. We need somebody who can go alongside Logan Gilbert, Marco, and if we choose to bring back a guy like a Tyler Anderson, that's fine. Um, if we, uh, I don't think we're keeping Kikuchi, so I think that's probably a good thing. What are we going to do alongside them? Uh, one option is Max Scherzer, who is about to turn 38. And right then and there, you should probably be looking at that and going, whoa, I don't know if I want to do this. But, uh, Max Scherzer is a Cy Young level pitcher. He's had many incredible years in recent times. He just came off a 15 and four season across two teams for the, uh, Dodgers and the Nationals. So to say he has nothing left in the tank is probably disingenuous. He's had pretty remarkable seasons in recent years. He made the All-Star game last year. He made the All-Star game seven straight times before 2020. But the age is a real concern. The fact that he could not pitch for the Dodgers in a do-or-die game last year is a concern. So I don't know how good I feel about this one. Here's a little bit of a sleeper. I was reading about this guy, Eduardo Rodriguez from the Boston Red Sox, about to turn 29. He'll turn 29 before the season starts. He seems to have gotten very unlucky last season, and that bad luck could mean that he gets less money, which means that you get to be the beneficiary of a guy who just had a rough season, mostly because of bad luck. His ERA last year was 4.74, um, which is not very good. He had a winning record because he was pitching for a good team in Boston. But according to his advanced metrics, his expected ERA, given how he was pitching and the contact he was giving up and the locations of the balls that were getting hit were, should have been much lower. Should have been in more in line with the last two years in Boston when he had a 3.8 um, ERA. <clears throat> so it seems to me that Eduardo Rodriguez was the victim of the defense in Boston. The defense was not very good, and that hurt him. Now, 
the the offense in Boston bailed him out and allowed him to win a lot of games despite having a high ERA. But I believe that Eduardo Rodriguez may have gotten unlucky last year, and if you bring him in, you're probably getting him a little cheaper than he should be, and you can be the beneficiary of him having hopefully bounce back luck in 2022. Okay, a few more pitchers I want to take a look at here. We've got Kevin Gaussman from the San Francisco Giants, about to turn 31. Um, this is a guy who has made the All Star game as recently as last season. Uh, he got a 14 and 6 record last year, 2.81 ERA, really strong. His advanced metrics are also quite good. They indicate a guy who should have about a 3 ERA, so either way you slice it, it's really good. Um, I, I think that this could be a decent consolation prize if you miss out on the next guy that I'm going to talk about. But um, he did finish sixth in Cy Young voting last year. He was in the MVP race as a fringe guy, made the All-Star game. Um, his career before last year is not amazing. In fact, some of these years, if you take a look at them, they're not very good at all. But some people are late bloomers. Now paying this guy a lot of money after he just had a monster contract year for a really good Giants team might be a bad idea. I'm not crazy about this one, but he certainly has to be on the list. But I would definitely put him below a couple of these other guys, especially the next guy I'm going to go into here, Robbie Ray from the Toronto Blue Jays, another potentially outgoing free agent, who just had a monster season, just won the Cy Young, and he's available. <clears throat> So I don't need to really sell you on Robbie Ray's credentials. Uh, almost 200 innings pitched. He had a 2.84 ERA. little bit of good luck there, but he still did lead the league in strikeouts, I think, which indicates a pitcher who does a lot of the dirty work for himself. It wasn't his first good season, but it was by far his best season. He did have one pretty decent year in Arizona in 2017, but it... It's not the greatest proposition in the world to give this guy a ton of money after he just had what is by far the best season of his career. But this guy has good stuff. He does earn it. He does get a lot of strikeouts. He is not dependent on amazing defense all the time. And if a guy like a Scherzer is a little too old for 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 your tastes, if if you just can't justify getting a pitcher that old, then. Robbie Ray's probably the best you can do. I mean, he, he was only 29 last year. It's not beyond the pale to say that he's finally settling into himself and finding his best stuff in the middle of his career. So I would definitely go after Robbie Ray. I, I think that of the options I've listed here, I think my dream offseason would be Seiya Suzuki and Robbie Ray. If you could get those two guys, I think you're well on your way. And then you can fill in the gaps with some lesser players. But those would probably be my top options. And if you want one more big-time infielder because you need to fill at second base as well as third base, maybe throw in Trevor Story. And I think you're cooking with gas. That's my take on the Mariners right now. Let me know what you guys think down below. See you guys later. Go Mariners.